Uh, we really appreciate that you're interested in this topic. It's about a topic I think is very much neglected uh, if you compare it to its potential or probable importance. We have only very few epidemiologically uh, valid findings in schizophrenic psychosis and two of them at least deal with gender differences. One being the later age of onset in women, which is very well established. We still do not know why. The other one being the second peak of illness onset after menopause. And there are other findings which have been replicated quite often. So I think it's worthwhile to look more into gender differences in order to understand something or something more about the pathogenesis of this, these disorders. And this is why we have now looked into gender differences in emerging psychosis. What do we see in the very early stages of this illness in the prodromal phase? Uh, in the at-risk mental state and in the first episode psychosis. We will have three, uh, four talks and um, one discussant, Alison Young as a discussant, and the first talk will not be given by Anna Menegeli as it is in the program as she is so busy organizing this congress, but will be given by Antonio Preti, who is a co-author, a co-worker of uh, their studies. He comes from Sardinia and had, has always collaborated with the Milano group. And he will give us the first talk on sex differences in people at ultra high risk of psychosis. Antonio, please. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you all, to all of you to be here. Uh, the topic of my presentation have a, as a background, the sex related differences in schizophrenia was being recorded uh, remember just uh, in this moment are characterized by important sex related uh, differences in clinical expression and outcome. Uh, one important difference the age of onset could tend to be earlier in men. Uh, Symptom severity of presentation have been uh, described as uh, different in um, men and women. Uh, treatment response and course of illness also uh, has been described as being different in uh, men and uh, women with a better outcome in women. Uh, genetic factors seem to be not specifically involved in this difference since uh, uh, differences tend to be uh, smaller in uh, non-Western countries, but in particular uh, sex differences in age of onset were not found in uh, cases with a higher uh, genetic load. So uh, genetics is not the main determinant of these differences. Uh, there are a lot of risk factors for the schizophrenia were described in epidemiological studies. On the other hand, they seem to be described uh, differently with different incidents in uh, men and uh, women. In particular, uh, substance abuse uh, uh, more often reported in uh, boys than in girls. Uh, the incidence of obstetric and perinatal complication also is uh, uh, there is some kind of the, uh, greater incidence in uh, uh, men than in uh, women. Uh, in uh, Western countries, the, the main difference concern the, uh, the outcome, with a better outcome in uh, women than in men. Uh, uh, women also are less likely to suffer from substance abuse, social drift, and law infringement that impact on the outcome of uh, psychosis within the spectrum <coughs> excuse me, in, in schizophrenia. Uh, the most invoked explanation for the difference is uh, related to uh, the impact of estrogen in women, but I will not uh, detail this, uh, uh, this hypothesis. Uh, what is interesting is uh, to uh, 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 investigate whether these differences that were reported in people diagnosed with schizophrenia also extend people in the high risk group, in people who have 
a greater risk of developing uh, psychosis within the spectrum of schizophrenia over time. Uh, the main interest could be uh, related to classification because uh, a continuity of uh, uh, risk uh, as far as differences by gender in uh, factor uh, just described could be uh, corroborate the classification of high-risk people within the spectrum of schizophrenia. Also, there will be uh, uh, greater information on the etiology of schizophrenia uh, from uh, a clinical uh, practice point of view, since uh, uh, if uh, gender differences have a role in uh, the spectrum of schizophrenia since the high risk uh, condition, uh, there will be uh, some kind of indication that an altered neurobiology is involved in these differences, so uh, a, a target for treatment could be uh, identified. Uh, with uh, the evidence so far of sex differences in ultra risk people is very small because there is uh, no great information about that. Uh, there is no many studies which investigate the topic. Uh, what we found, uh, it is, uh, can, is, was described in the most recent review on the, the topic, that uh, there is, may be a greater risk of transition to schizophrenia in males compared to females, but this evidence is not evenly replicated in independent sample. Uh, okay. uh, there could be a greater incidence of negative symptoms in uh, uh, men in the high-risk group. Uh, again, this is an inconsistent evidence because independent group uh, uh, did found uh, the exact replication of the finding. Uh, the most evidence concerned the worst uh, premorbid uh, psychosocial functioning in, uh, in males compared to females, which is the most often observed finding in studies on uh, high risk people. And there could be a, a greater incidence of cognitive uh, uh, dysfunction in, in males compared to females, but again, the evidence is not very strong. Uh, for example, the latest uh, uh, review on cognitive in a risk mental state did, did not discuss the uh, gender differences per, because there are very uh, few studies exploring the topic. Uh, mm, the studies I present here concern data from the uh, Programma 2000, which is the first early intervention services developed in Italy, in Milan, uh, with uh, leading uh, from uh, Angelo Cocchi and uh, Anna Meneghelli. The data concern are studies including uh, over 10 years of uh, uh, admission of people with uh, ultra risk uh, for psychosis and first episode of psychosis. And uh, the focus of the study concern the impact of factor which may be differently distributed among uh, boys and girls, uh, which may have an incidence on the transition to psychosis, particular stress and system use, which may be differently distributed between boys and girls, and the role of protective factor, uh, which may protect females from the incidence of stress or trauma, in particular the better ability of girls and uh, women to achieve to social network for prote protection and for social support. Uh, sorry, uh, the study concerned uh, 140 patients uh, diagnosed with third episode psychosis within the spectrum of uh, schizophrenia in uh, uh, 120, 120 subjects at ultra high risk of psychosis. Uh, the study includes all consecutive admission to the program over 10 years and uh, uh, diagnosis were on based on standard criteria as far as the diagnosis of uh, uh, first episode of psychosis within the spectrum of schizophrenia, and we used the Melbourne criteria for the diagnosis of the condition of ultra high risk of psychosis. Uh, all patients were assessed with validated scales uh, as far as their symptoms and associated condition. Uh, my results in uh, these studies were a difference in the distribution of uh, uh, boys and uh, girls in the access to the uh, program. There were uh, overwhelming uh, 
uh, greater majority of males than females, which confirm that the uh, earlier chess of uh, uh, or, or early incidence or onset of the condition is confirmed also in uh, people at ultra risk of psychosis. And also the uh, age of entry was uh, uh, People, males in first episode of psychosis were younger than, uh, uh, than girls in first episode of psychosis. Uh, difference in age, however, were not found in the ultra risk group. This is the first difference between people diagnosed with first episode and people diagnosed with ultra risk of psychosis. The ultra risk group uh, are not, were not different as far as age uh, was concerned. Ages of onset. Uh, duration of untreated illness also was difference between males and females. Males tend to have a longer duration of untreated illness compared to females. Uh, in red are the differences that are statistically significant on a threshold of uh, 0.05, the most conservative threshold for statistical significance. And the duration of uh, untreated illness also was different in males compared to females in the first episode of schizophrenia groups. The difference in duration of untreated illness was not found in the ultra-risk group. Again, <coughs> I'm sorry, the ultra-risk group, uh, was, uh, there was no difference as far as uh, gender or sex uh, in a duration of untreated illness, which was found in people with a first episode of psychosis within the spectrum of schizophrenia. Uh, no other significant differences were found by gender in uh, these groups. Uh, patients with uh, uh, first episode uh, uh, of psychosis, uh, there were no difference in, in the incidence of traumatic events on suicide attempt. Uh, in uh, patients with uh, a first episode, the ultra risk, there was a greater incidence of stustem use in boys than in girls, but uh, the difference did not extend to uh, substance abuse. And uh, we, more importantly, we found no important sex interaction on uh, symptom severities or level of functioning in, in uh, both groups. The only difference with some interest for the uh, preliminary hypothesis was a greater exposure to uh, traumatic events in uh, girls in the group of people with ultra risk, uh, with reported a greater incidence of traumatic uh, uh, events of different kind, in particular sexual harassment, than boys. This difference was not found in people diagnosed with first episode uh, of psychosis. Uh, we think that the difference were very tiny in these groups. Uh, uh, essentially, uh, in the ultra risk group, we found no great evidence of a difference by sex in symptoms presentation, in the incidence of substance abuse, in the incidence of traumatic events, or in the incidence of other factor that might explain uh, a greater transition to psychosis in males, so the greater incidence, an early incidence of uh, psychosis in uh, men than in women. Uh, we still think, however, that the stress and the impact of substance use and abuse in particular may have some role in uh, the transition to psychosis in people at ultra dry risk. It may distinguish people who may later have a transition to psychosis from people who do not transit to psychosis and remain outside the spectrum of schizophrenia. Thank you for your attention. Was the age limit for your service or your study? Was there, uh, there is a, a, a limit uh, 
of uh, 18 years old because yeah. uh, below 18 years old people are to be treated in another circuit yeah. of treatment in uh, neuro in uh, child uh, adolescence uh, psychiatric services and the upside uh, limit was uh, 35 uh, people with higher 35 age were not included in uh, the studies because uh, an onset uh, above 35 year age old is considered too late to be considered a first episode. So could this be an explanation for you having 70% male patients that you didn't consider the women who develop the illness uh, it, 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 is, it is possible that a fraction yeah. of women uh, with transition to psychosis very late were not included in the studies mm. because uh, the studies have a very uh, age yeah. limit both in entrance and in uh, exit. Mm -hmm. Yes, this is mm -hmm. really possible. Mm. Other questions? No? To you. Okay. The technician share I didn't know we is now. <laughs> so the next oh. I have to introduce the next presenter, which is myself. Which is Anita Kikurosa, which I think there is no need of presentation because of very famous and research on sex difference and on the epidemiology of schizophrenia. So give it to her the, the voice. Thank you. I come from Basel um, and we are doing schizophrenia research there for uh, since almost 20 years now and before that I was in Mannheim working with Heinz Hefner in this ABC study and I'll present data mainly from Basel, recent data of course now. So can you give me uh, my slides, please? Yes. So this is the nice city of Baal. And uh, if you have been at the EU GI meeting, just uh, the last meeting, the last symposium, you have heard that the quality of life, even for patients, there is the best in Europe, at least within these EU centers. So. Um, I will give you results from our Basel FEPSI study. Uh, FEPSI stands for Früherkennung von Psychosen. This means in German early detection of psychosis. Background first, very uh, slightly, and then going into different aspects of our FEPSI patients we have looked into. You all know this uh, sort of uh, graph. It is demonstrating the slow onset of psychosis and we in Mannheim uh, were one of the first who had these results in a representative uh, uh, population of all first admitted patients over two years from a catchment area of 1.5 million in the mid of the 80s and we saw that about five years on average before the first psychotic symptoms occurs, there are the first unspecific sim symptoms and then it is usually another one to two years with psychotic symptoms until the illness is diagnosed and treated. And what we also found in that study um, you see here is that this is different in men and women. That Obviously, they have the same sort of slow onset, but at different ages. What you see here is that um, in men, in males, uh, index admission with this first diagnosis here at the age of 28.5 on average, that was in the mid-80s, and in women at the age of 30. Two, and here you see the first signs of a mental disorder, first psychotic symptom, uh, start of the index episode, which leads to the hospitalization. And all of that is like a parallel later in women. 
And I think this is a very important finding together with the finding that it is mainly women who have a late onset after age 40, after menopause, which could explain something which we still don't know uh, about the pathogenesis of these psychoses. Uh, and we have founded this early detection center in Baal in 1998. And I tell you now um, what kind of study with, we did uh, uh, together with this early detection center accompanying our patients. Uh, you, you see here. We do a screening, which is um, a screening instrument developed by us because the CAMS was not available by then. But it's very, it's testing the same criteria as the CAMS, more or less. Um, and we then decide based on this screening instrument which patients are at risk, which have no risk, and which have already first episode psychosis. We do a basic uh, investigation with them regarding all these different domains and then we follow them up uh, regularly um, in the first year monthly in the second year quarterly and uh, all three months and and so on until five years all of the at-risk patients are followed up at least for five years and what I show you now are the gender differences of these patients at risk and the first episode psychosis patients when they came to us and already had oh God, this is already had frank psychosis the pointer doesn't work really um uh, you see here, we have on the whole screened uh, until end of last year, we screened 655 uh, people, 428 of those were men and 227 women. And what uh, we can discuss this gender difference very similar with you. And uh, it's very important, I think, why we get more referrals of men than women. Oh, gosh, terrible. 271 patients we found to be at risk with that screening instrument. Um, and of those, 173 participated in the five-year follow-up. And of those, 39 have, uh, in the next five years, made the transition to psychosis. And 67 never uh, transited to psychosis. And in these 67, we are still in the intermediate sort of position. I cannot decide whether they will still make the transition or not because the follow-up was less than three years. And we have found in many studies now that you have trans quite a lot of transition rates even in the third year. So before that, you cannot really say this is a non-transitioning patient and you cannot really compare them. So the results I'll show you are always now between those with no transition, real non-transition, and those with transition, and we leave out that intermediate group for a while. You see here, this is a busy slide, just to show you um, the proportion of women in the arms at risk mental state patients, only 30%, same in the first episode patients. And what you see here, we don't have this upper age limit. We start with age 18 as well, but no upper age limit. And you see here that in the FEP group, for example, 27% of the women came after age 35, and at least 19% uh, of the men. You see here the age distribution of men and women attending our service. You see the at-risk mental state, men here, women here, the first episode patients, uh, men here, women here. So now what about gender differences? Symptomatology. Very often it was said that symptomatology is different. 
We first of all looked into the very, very first signs. The patients told us what they had noticed themselves as a first change in their own mental state. Retrospectively, what do you think? How did it start, um, the illness? And what you see here, there are only slight differences in between men and women. We are just about to publish this. Um, men more often remember that they first notice problems with concentration and thinking. But there were no other gender differences, and if we correct it for multiple testing, also this significance disappeared. If we ask the first episode patients, the other ones were the at-risk mental state, in the first episode patients, there was one slight other difference. Women with the first episode retrospectively remembered that they had first noticed anxieties and worries. All of a sudden they were more anxious, more worried, and they thought that was the beginning of their disease about five years earlier, on average. Now, and how were the symptoms when they really came and presented to our clinic? You see that here. Um, also here, we had some uh, slight gender differences. Um, Few of them were significant. These are only tendencies. There is one significant gender difference in the brief psychiatric rating scale in the at-risk mental state group with women uh, reporting more pre-psychotic phenomena, especially uh, sub-threshold hallucinations and sub-threshold uh, delusions. But nothing else, and again, if you're correct for multiple testing, no significance anymore. Interesting always is help-seeking behavior, because we know from other diseases that women usually have a better help-seeking behavior than men. At least they seek help more quickly. And here we asked for the first people they turned to. Whom did they ask for help first? And you see here that um, there was only one significant gender difference. Men first turned to their partner. Uh, women first turned to their partner. Men very rarely did that. But what do you think is the reason for that? Yeah, men usually don't have a partner in, with this uh, disease but women often have, and they turn to their part. Then the other difference we found that is similar to yours, Antonio, uh, duration of untreated psychosis. There was a significant gender difference. You see here, duration of untreated psychosis in first episode women was six months. In men, it was 24 months, which is highly significant. Duration of untreated illness, there we didn't find a significant difference. Neurocognition, another interesting domain. Here we also had a control group of healthy people here, and we did different uh, neuropsychological tests uh, regarding executive functioning, IQ, attention and working memory, verbal learning and memory. And also here we found only very few differences uh, that female at risk mental state patients had worse reaction time in working memory or that female first episode patients had uh, better, single better measures in executive executive functioning and verbal learning. Um, but there was no interaction between sex and group, whether they belonged to the healthy controls or the arms or the FEP. The differences we found in our patients were very similar to the differences in healthy controls. 
So if there are any slight differences like women being better in verbal learning, um, that seems to mirror the general population where we also know that women on average, of course, only on average, not every, have better, slightly better verbal uh, abilities than men. And um, so our uh, patients are not specific. They are like the, the gender differences uh, like in the general population. One last uh, thing I'm very interested in is uh, prolactin as a stress indicator. Uh, because we have often seen that patients, even without antipsychotic medication, have elevated prolactin levels, and prolactin is a stress hormone. Um, and you see here the proportion of hyperprolactinemia, that means how many people have a prolactin level uh, way out of the norm, over the norm, um, over the reverence, reference level. And you see here, it is mainly women who have a higher prolactin level than their maximum reverence level of the laboratory. You see here the at-risk mental state women. Here, definitely many women higher than the upper allowed level, and especially in the first episode women, very, very high prolactin levels. So hyperprolactinemia in 53% uh, of women uh, and 25% of men with at-risk mental state, and in 39% of women and 26% of men uh, with, oh, th that was first episode, and this one is at-risk mental state. And what is really fitting very well with this is, is a pituitary volume increase. We also found a pituitary volume increase in our at-risk mental state uh, with and without transition and also in the first episode patients. And you see here the men, they have increased pituitary volumes, especially here in the first episode patients, first episode. The females, the women, have increased pituitary volumes in almost all groups, especially in the at-risk mental state with transition. And prolactin is produced in the pituitary, so there could be a connection and also to stress, as Ines will tell you in a minute. Transition rates, the last thing, transition rates do not significantly differ in between men and women. It's not significant, although one could think 39% transition rate in women and 35% in men. There is a slight, but it's not a significant difference. But we still have quite a high uh, transition rate. So we think our at-risk mental states are really at-risk mental states. And last not least, what are the most significant predictors and do they show you hear suspiciousness a sociality, anhedonia, working memory, and so on. So, summary, only very few gender differences in symptomatology. We would need much bigger samples to really establish uh, if there are real differences. They are not significant in our small samples. Help-seeking, women have more partners, they more often turn to their partners. Duration of untreated psychosis significantly shorter in women. Neurocognition, only very few gender differences, similar to those in healthy controls. Hyperprolactinemia in both genders, but mainly in women. Same is true for pituitary volume increase and transition rates, no gender differences. Thank you. So we can have one or two questions, if they're very short. Yeah? We excluded affective psychosis, right, from the very beginning, uh, but we didn't look at fertility rates, no.
But yeah, it's a good question. We should. Mm -hmm. took a long time to have a diagnosis and treatment. It also, uh, uh, girls, women uh, tend to have a greater uh, awareness of uh, symptoms that may mm -hmm. signal a change in psychological functioning. They put a greater attention to social anxiety mm -hmm. and prep psychotic symptoms. It, it may be there is some effect on pathways and some effect of uh, understanding on their own psychological states. Mm -hmm. What do you think about this? I agree completely. Um, the only thing is what we have to explain, but maybe we can discuss that after Alison has given her last uh, talk, is why we get so few women then, if they have this better uh, symptom uh, insight yes, and, uh, inter and yeah. So, I might introduce the next speaker then. Uh, this is uh, Ines Mayen Games from Leuven. She is a psychologist and psychiatrist uh, at the University of Leuven and um, a professor there. And she has um, always had an interest in env environmental factors uh, contributing to psychopathology and especially, especially in stress. Ines, please. Uh, thank you, and thank you for having me in this symposium. Um, so, indeed, I will speak about um, uh, differences in uh, stress reactivity, but also on um, differences in symptomatology as they express in daily life. And uh, this had nice pictures. This is a typical apple uh, problem that it now doesn't show up so basically saying that um, as we already heard uh, there is um, the idea that uh, women express uh, symptomatology different maybe less um, and one of the problems of course uh, if you want to uh, investigate that is that it's very difficult to do that unbiased because you know when you interview someone whether it's a man or a woman and so one way to get around that is to um, so you cannot blind researchers for gender and uh, one way to get around that is to use self-assessment um, and uh, yeah my research has mostly uh, evolved around experience sampling so a daily life measure where you basically have people reporting on their mood symptoms um, in their uh, daily life. Um, we do it typically, we measure people um, 10 times a day at random moments during six days. Um, and this sort of is an overview of what you then get, uh, a number of variables within each of these beeps. And uh, this allowed us to investigate how do symptoms express in daily life, but also how do people differ in terms of their reactivity to stress. Um, so I will currently uh, explain you a little bit about uh, the, the, the current study. So we compared healthy controls with uh, 268 uh, at-risk people, uh, in contrast with the previous speakers, these are not people at ultra-high risk, but these are, these are people on the con uh, psychosis continuity, either genetically or psychometrically at risk, and uh, we compared them to 230 uh, patients who were already uh, had a diagnosis of psychosis. Um, and here you see the distribution of uh, males and females. Um, so we had a fairly even distribution, except for in the at-risk group where we had more males. Um, 
And so we first looked at the difference, the gender difference in expression of symptoms. So these are the symptoms that people do report in their daily life themselves. Um, and for hallucinations, we ask people, do you hear things that other people cannot hear? Do you see things that other people cannot see? And as you see, um, there is over the three groups no difference in uh, in hallucinations, in intensity of hallucinations, and there are very little hallucinations present in the at-risk group. Um, if we look at delusional thinking, um, we see a different pattern. Again, this is self-report, so of course you cannot ask people, please rate on a scale how delusional you are at this moment. So these are questions that people can report, such on uh, questions such as, um, I feel suspicious. I feel that people are there uh, are wanting to harm me. Um, I'm preoccupied by my thoughts. Um, I'm afraid to lose control. Things like that. Um, and here you see um, that both in the at risk and in the patient population, um, men tend to uh, have a slighter higher score on the uh, delusions. Delusions. We also looked at other symptoms, such as anxiety, for example, and people then report uh, how anxious am I at this moment. And again, uh, we see that in the at-risk group, the men tend to be slightly more anxious than the women, which is quite interesting because it is a bit in contrast with what you were showing. And that might maybe have to do with the fact that if people report in the moment, it's a bit different than when they reflect back on things. Um, but we don't find that in the patients. And if we uh, ask about depressed symptoms, so I feel down at, uh, at this moment, um, we see uh, no difference. In the at-risk group, men tend to have slightly more uh, depressed feelings, but it, this did not reach significance. So if we uh, take this overall picture, uh, basically um, what we see is that uh, overall there was, in terms of symptom expression in real life, there was a very little difference between men and uh, males and females. And if there was a difference, it was consistently so that men uh, presented more symptoms than women. And it was also clear that the biggest difference was happening in these early phases in the at-risk state. Um, we uh, just finished uh, a study in, in um, a clinical at-risk population. Unfortunately, the data were not cleaned, clean enough to already um, analyze these for, the, for today. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm expecting to see the same pattern as these people who are on the continuity of psychosis, as we already did find that uh, in this early stage, there is a higher um, uh, variability in, in symptoms. Um, with the experience sampling methods, you cannot only look at symptoms, but you can also look at the express, expression of behavior. Uh, is there a difference between men and women in uh, how they function? Um, and the first thing that we looked at was social context. Um, so how often are, uh, is there a difference in the time that uh, people are together with other people or the time that they're actually alone? Um, so we investigated whether uh, men and women differed in the, the amount of time that they were uh, on their own. And um, as you can see, um, so this is the, the one means that there is no difference between men and women. Going up means uh, that women are more often alone, going down men more often alone. Um, and overall, we found that um, um, the con in the controls and in the at-risk state that uh, men were more often alone compared to women. Um, and that it slightly changed in the patients, uh, although this was not significantly different from one. Um, so there is a difference between men and women in the amount of time that they spend on their own. And this was even more pronounced when we looked at goal-directed activities. So we basically asked people, what are you doing at the moment? Uh, and as we have random sampling, we can get a good 
time budget or we can get, get a good estimate of how often people are actually spending time in goal-directed activities. And uh, what we found was that in all groups, women spend more time in goal-directed activities compared to men. Um, and that was, uh, again, true in, in all populations. So if we look at behavior in context, uh, there were a bit more differences between men and female compared to what we saw in the symptoms. Uh, men were more often alone than women, and women were more um, involved in goal-directed activities than men. So then uh, let's move to the sex differences uh, in emotional reactivity to daily life stress. Um, in this paper in 2004, uh, we found that women uh, were more stress reactive and we discussed that they were possibly more on an effective pathway to psychosis um, and that women uh, were uh, probably more susceptible to the schizoaffective expression of psychosis. Now, what I wanted to do right now is uh, basically um, compare that to, well, does that still hold that finding in a bigger sample? but also um, really related to something that uh, Anita has already discussed, that is that really particular for patients with psychosis, or is this maybe just an, an overall gender difference between men and women that we happen to see also uh, when someone develops a psychosis? In this study, we didn't have control subjects, so we couldn't look at that. But in the current data, um, we obviously have enough uh, power to, to look at these interactions. So the question is, does that still hold? So we define stress reactivity as the emotional reaction that people have towards a stressful experience in the moment. Stressful experiences are obviously small things as we measure in daily life from moment to moment. So these are uh, being doing an activity that you're not motivated for or you feel you're not very skilled for, or uh, having a daily hassle, um, an annoying phone call or uh, a struggle, uh, uh, with your teenage daughters, for example. Um, and um, so we then investigated what is the relationship between these stressful experiences and negative affect. Um, and this is uh, men and women from the general population. And um, although the lines seem quite similar, uh, this still reached the statistical uh, significance with women showing a larger increase in negative aff affect when stress goes up compared to men. And uh, you might say, well, this is really a small difference, um, but you have to imagine that this is just a slight overreactivity happening every mo 10 times a day, six days in a row. Um, and we then also looked at the uh, patients and uh, in yellow are the female patients and in orange the male patients. And again, uh, we found a significant difference uh, between uh, female and male patients, with the female patients showing more negative affect uh, when stress went up compared to the males. Um, there was no three-way interaction uh, which states, which suggests that the difference we see between men and women um, is the same in the healthy controls compared to the patient group. Thus, indeed, under uh, or suggesting that this is more a, an overall gender difference rather than a specific than gender difference related to psychosis. Uh, so there was no three-way interaction. Um, we then also uh, wanted to take this one step further and say, so why, so what happens with positive events? Um, is it also so true that um, there is a difference between men and women in the way they react to positive events, or is it really on stress sensitivity? Um, so then we looked at positive things that people report in their daily life and the way they respond to that with an increase in positive affect. And then uh, we also see 
that uh, in the healthy uh, population, uh, women tend to react stronger to positive events compared to men. So they have a slightly higher increase in positive affect. And um, this was true for the both groups. So I didn't show the, 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 the patients differently because, again, no three-way interaction was found. So overall, women tend to react stronger to positive events than men. So if we uh, put all that together, um, what we can say is that, um, in general, um, women are a bit more stress-reactive uh, than men but women are also overall a bit more reward sensitive. So they tend to react both to negative and positive, a bit more both to the, uh, negative and positive environments. Um, and that is, uh, that is true for women in general. That is not only true for uh, uh, females with a psychotic disorder, that seems to be true for all for for women in general, and then if we put everything together, um, so you could argue that this could be a protective mechanism: the fact that you can actually, um, yeah, get also positive effect from from a positive environment. So to put everything together. Okay. Um, with using a large sample and using self-report in real life, we found a little differences in symptoms uh, between men and women. Uh, if different, uh, mostly these differences resemble um, uh, what we see in the general population. Um, and in terms of mechanisms, we see a higher reactivity in women, uh, which may be protective, especially if you combine it with the previous finding that women are more in social contact. Um, so they are both more in social contact and they gain more from it because this uh, social contact is mostly seen as a positive environment and uh, most people tend to get more positive effect out of that. Um, so if you combine that with a later onset, this might be one of the mechanisms explaining why uh, women in general tend to have uh, better outcomes. Um, so this is uh, my uh, new center for contextual psychiatry that uh, we started last year in Leuven and uh, some of the funding uh, agencies and I thank you for your attention. Thanks. Beautiful work, thank you very much. Uh, I'm just curious, uh, with your uh, experience sampling method, uh, I'm sure that you are able to look at the dynamics and uh, delays and habituation between an event and the emotional response. What have you learned doing that? Yes, um, that is a very good question. And um, we are still, well, what we're currently trying to do is um, get a bit more developed the statistics a bit more to to also really outline that like because that of course is a very important issue like how long does an effect last and uh, and you would expect that this lingers on longer and that people tend to um, not recover from or recover from events slower uh, over time uh, the problem that we have with experience sampling is that there is a huge variability in timing, so it's random random sampling, so so the delays between different beeps are different. Um, so we are, are also now looking into longer sampling frames so that you can really look much more closely into what is the actual uh, difference between two beeps and how can you then model um, the, the, the result or the effects and how long it lasts. So it's, it's work in progress, I would say, yeah. And now we have Alison Young who will discuss our results and lead the discussion with you. Alison, please. <laughs> 
Oh, yes, I have. No, I don't have to introduce Alison Young. Oh, yes, Everybody no, knows her. <laughs> <laughs> Alison, please, we okay, look forward uh, to your discussion. Uh, thank you very much. Um, this is a real test of my uh, processing speed and verbal memory. Uh, and I, I didn't make it easy for myself because I actually forgot to bring any uh, paper. So I've written some notes um, on some dockets that I found in my handbag as well as the back of my hand. Um, so we'll see how we go. So thank you to all our presenters today uh, for uh, talking to us about gender differences uh, in both early psychosis and the at-risk mental state. Um, I guess some uh, results really stand out. We can think about gender differences in terms of gender differences that we see in the general population um, that we also then see in uh, the illness groups. And we can also think about gender differences that we see in the illness factors. Um, so we saw that, and this is probably no surprise to people, that um, women tend to have uh, greater social support networks than men, and that might be a protective factor. Um, we saw from Ines presentation that um, the, there's a uh, English poem actually by Rudyard Kipling that says, um, if you can meet with triumph and disaster and meet those two imposters just the same. Um, and that's meant to be a good thing, according to um, Rudyard Kipling. But it seems that men are better at doing that than women because women uh, react more to negative um, events but also more to positive events. So is it perhaps that they are getting more protection from, from actually being able to respond and seek help around those negative events but also experiencing maybe more joy around the positive events um, so whether that is a, also a protective factor that then translates into... Um, we also saw from all of our presenters that there are differences in um, illness factors and illness behaviour um, so that women are more likely to seek help than men, probably more likely to seek help early than men, which is then translated into the longer duration of untreated psychosis that we see in men compared to women. And we know, of course, that that is one, a major variable in terms of prediction of outcome. Um, so, so there were those, those two sort of ways of, of thinking about things and how we put things together. We also saw another illness factor uh, with men having higher rates of substance abuse and, of course, that being a factor in um, the predicting outcome as well. Um, so how do we put it together? Because, I mean, one of the interesting things about the help seeking was women are more likely to seek help, and yet in both the first episode and the at-risk uh, cohorts that we saw in all higher in men than in women. So that's why we're seeing those differences. Um, so there is some evidence for that. I think the, that one figure that's come out is a 1.4 to 1 ratio, men to women. Um, but is it actually, if we kind of think outside the box, and people who are in this, um, the session that was in this room just before this symposium, we were talking about transdiagnostic um, models and whether help seeking is enhanced by using a really transdiagnostic early youth mental health model. Could it be that women are seeking help um, before things get into this, the uh, more severe stages? So are they seeking help and actually getting help early for mood symptoms? Um, are, they, are they getting help um, from, from more primary care um, before things actually get worse? So that's another possibility that hasn't really been explored and maybe we could uh, discuss. Um, and finally, we saw the illness factor um, in the brain structure, which showed that actually there's, um, and we also saw it in relation to neurocognition and negative symptoms, that men tend to already before there's any um, illness factors have higher rates of uh, neurocognitive deficits. And then in terms of illness factors, that seems to be accelerated. We see accelerated uh, structural changes in men compared to women. Um, in those illness groups. So could that be another factor that, that we're looking at as well in terms of gender differences um, in presentations and outcomes? Um, so a bit of a messy uh, type of discussion, the best I could do with little pieces of paper in the back of my hand. Um, and I'd just like to open it up now then for more general discussion. Thank you. question. 
Do we have any discussion points? You don't even have to have a question, you can just have a point. Well, I am uh, i don't know whether anyone has an answer to it, but I'm wondering about, we, we've been talking about sex differences, but sometimes we refer to them as gender differences, and of course there is a difference between sex and gender. So I'm wondering whether there is anything known about gender differences, because most of what we talk about are really sex differences. Yeah, it's an interesting question. Um... I wonder if some of the behaviour is around gender rather than sex. So certainly sex, we think about oestrogen, brain changes, etc. But, um, you know, there, there is such a thing as gender because some people want to be one gender and not uh, the gender that they were born into. And, and why is it? Is it that they feel that women get more social support? I don't know, but it's a very interesting question. I, I would agree that um, sex is the biological sort of things, but what we have seen is the illness behavior is different. That would be a gender, a gender aspect. Thing, yeah. yeah. I, I wanted to. Because I, I, I think it deserves clarification. Uh, I mean, gender, it's a, it's a subjective concept, right? A gender identity. So I can be obviously biologically a man, but I can be, uh, in terms of the identity, I can be a woman. And at least in most of the sex uh, gender literature, we, we do make the distinction. So, so unless in all your research you have been asking your, your participants whether they consider themselves men or women, then I think unless you have that answer, then uh, making the assumption that there is an alignment between sex and gender may not be always valid. And I'm just wondering whether, depending on, uh, let's say, in transgender individuals, whether you would find something different from uh, the general population studies that are basically making the assumption that we are talking about biological sex and in 90% or whatever it is. Uh, sex and gender are aligned. So that's what I mean. Uh, what I measure, whether it's self-report or biology or, I mean, the outcomes are independent of, uh, of, uh, uh, of the concept, I think. So that's what I, I was asking about. I quite understand what you mean, but what we were referring to is more the term as it was used until, say, some years ago, that gender was more the term for the psychosocial aspects and sex more for the biological aspects. Ines. Yeah, I think um, what's interesting in that perspective is that um, if you talk about gender identity, then that becomes more of a, a risk factor or a developmental factors, such as the whole uh, issue of identity probably is relevant in the development of psychosis. So, in, but that, that is a bit a different approach than, than that has been taken here, but I think it's a very relevant approach. Um, as people, as we know that uh, uh, identity development, but also the way you then relate to other people, and that is based on how you see yourself and how you see others, is, is really relevant. So in that respect, I think it's a very interesting topic to further investigate. I wanted to um, discuss this one point again, which I'm really very interested in. When we did this study in the Mannheim area in the mid-80s, we really had a representative population of all first admitted over two years of a whole catchment area, of, and these were almost 400 people. And there we saw that men and women had the same incidence. It was just a delay in women. That uh, Women very often only fell ill after age 40. So it was 20% who still were first admitted after age 40. But then if you went up to age 60, the incidence in men and women was the same. And my personal feeling is that nowadays you're probably right because treatment starts much earlier. Women go earlier, see the general GP, and the disease never get, gets as severe as it used to get 
say 20 years ago in women because they see help earlier and not in psychiatry and get treated earlier. And mm -hmm. Van Werft has, I think they had this odds ratio of 1.2 now with the last recent meta-analysis. Mm -hmm. But the point I want to make that our early detection services, I think, are somehow seeking for the young male, really. I must admit we ourselves in Basel as well, we also have this strange distribution. But I think it's because we always give this picture of the typical prodromal we are seeking for. It's young, male, uh, and and so on. And we even in our in our symposia we use these or in the um, educational courses for young uh, doctors. We use the typical examples of the young male. And I think we probably also do not open our services really for the women. And many services stop with an age cutoff of 35, which you, you can't get these. Yeah, no, um, I, well, I've noted to you, but just to, to make a comment on that. Um, so are any of you here from England? Um, so uh, the NHS in England has recently, in April 2016, changed the age criteria for early psychosis services. So they now go up to the age of 65. Uh, and it will be very interesting to see what the impact of that age range uh, change is on the distribution of males and females. So I think the, um, if we combine that with sort of studies that are looking at youth mental health, at transdiagnostic approaches, there's always more women in those early sort of services than men, uh, and then we can add that to our knowledge with the older group. We can really get a bit bit more of a picture about whether there's truly a difference in incidence or it's just around those help-seeking behaviours. Yeah, uh, to relate to that, um, we are currently running a clinical trial in people at ultra-high risk. And uh, for that, we are reaching out to different services, not specifically focusing on psychosis. So, for example, focusing on anxiety and depression. And what you then see, this, those services say we're saying, oh, but this does not apply to our population. But then we use the PQ and six out of mm -hmm. 10 score high on the PQ. So it might relate to, to what you were saying. It's something that people that we're simply not looking for. But when you actually go into this broader domain, you do find probably a lot of women also there with this uh, uh, at risk mental state. How, how are we One going for time, minute. Anita? <laughs> Two more minutes. Two more. One final question. Okay. If not, you want to have a concluding remark? Oh, with, with two microphones. You can hear me in <laughs> stereo. Um, now, I would like to thank all of our speakers um, and for uh, the audience for your attention and your discussion. Um, I don't know if we've actually answered the question about uh, whether there are gender differences in incidents, what gender differences are, are there, what the mechanisms are, but we certainly opened up some interesting discussion and um, listened to some very interesting data. So thank you, everyone. Thank you.